Hello, students, and welcome to our final week. I'm so proud of you. I'm excited for us to wrap up this great study in a great way in week eight. So let's hop right into it. First of all, I want to share with everyone that I'm excited for the great work that was done in our week seven dialogue groups. And so thank you for that robust conversation. I will be back later today, Monday, and begin posting break grades for those. Remember that a completed assignment involved your original assignment, your one required reply to a fellow group member, and to meeting the general word account requirements for those. Uh, we were a bit more um, uh, relaxed in the formality Many of you also went ahead and uh, put in citation form references, and I thank you for that. Most all of you included some direct references to uh, the key terms that we were discussing this week in this rather strange and absurd scenario we were working with. And there were a variety of thoughts about it. Um, and I really appreciate the willingness to share perspective while, be open, while being open to be guided and influenced by the perspective to respectfully consider the perspective of others. And so that will be wrapping up. That's the end of it. Remember, due to the very nature of these dialogue group assignments, there are no extensions of time. So this assignment was finished up last night at the end of the day. Um, but I would encourage you that if you did not post your original be sure to do that. Don't just uh, not do anything. The grade will indeed be capped, but uh, don't give yourself um, a zero. Go ahead and do the work and the grade will be capped there, but that will be coming later today. I also want to let you know that um, all of the later assignments, particularly from week six and week seven into this week need to be submitted by Saturday, March 5. Um, we don't need to concern ourselves now about what went on in week five or earlier. Uh, those who had special circumstances, we've already worked those matters out between us, or I've attempted to reach you and perhaps not have heard back from you, but any assignments that are due from week six and week seven must be submitted by Saturday, March 5. Remember that Saturday, not Sunday, our course ends on Saturday. Now, the nature and short turnaround that we have here in week eight um, on this final paper that we have in, requires focus and uh, discipline. I'm nearby if I can be of help to you, but we've got a lot of work to do here as we finish up. And here's going to be our week eight theme, sins of the heart. We're going to be looking at the 10th commandment, do not covet, in its various stipulations in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 13 and 14. We're going to be reading this week on themes of covetousness, but we're also going to be looking at the root of covetousness or what develops as a result of envy and covetous toward others, covetous toward others, and that is hate. Hatred, bigotry, can be the source, the tap root of what causes us to envy, or because we have become envious, desirous of possessing whatever position, material, status, someone else has a value to us, we can be prone to become hateful or bitter. And so we're going to be looking at these, these underlying causes of covetousness and hatred. And we're going to be looking at the opposite, uh, emotional and behavioral attitudinal and, 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 and um, behavioral response to covetousness, and that is contentment, and we're going to be looking at the opposite of hatred, which is love. The best way for us to combat our own fallen nature of covetousness, desiring inordinately or inappropriately that which belongs to another, 
is for us to become people of contentment from the inside out and therefore to be able to experience and express love. So these are our key terms and concepts this week, and we have some more readings. Uh, our final reading in our main text from Philip Ryken, uh, written in stone, is his chapter 13, simply titled, Being Content. There is a school of thought that says that the best way to obey commandments 5 through 9 is to obey commandment number 10. In other words, one of the greatest ways for us to continue to honor our parents, our father and our mother, is to obey commandment number 10, to learn to be content, right? The best way for us to honor the sanctity of life, do not murder, is to be content, to obey, practice the 10th command, not commit adultery, not steal not bear false witness. The best way for us to avoid these negative duties is to practice the 10th command, to learn to be content, to learn to love rather than hate. So this is going to be an important final read in Riken's book. But we're also going to be reading, again, from our favorite ancient uh, philosopher here, uh, one of them at least, Thomas Aquinas, and he's going to be helping us understand the nature of hatred and uh, whether or not it's permitted for a person desiring to imitate God to ever hate one's neighbor. We're going to be looking at the teachings of John and the teachings of Jesus on this matter from Aquinas' perspective and in his classical raising objections and responding to those objections approach that we've seen throughout our study of his work in Summa Theologica. He does that this time as well on that section that um, we'll be reading. We're also going to be reading, and I'm really fascinated for us to have the opportunity to go into some, some literature, some English and American literature, because we're going to be reading after this week Edgar Allan Poe, and we're going to be reading his classic, The Cast of Amontillado. It's a classic story about what envy does and what covetousness does what hatred toward someone else because of the station they possess or the material possessions that they have acquired or whatever it is about them that we have fixated on, how can that can corrupt the soul and it can lead us to homicidal behavior. And so it's going to be a fascinating read. If you've not read it before, I think you're really going to appreciate it. And then finally, our final reading this week is going to come, and I'm so grateful for this, and it would seem that the timing on this is almost providential, and that is we're going to be reading a piece from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called Strength to Love. He's going to be talking to us about how to love rather than hate, and he's going to talk to us about why to love rather than hate. This could not be a more contemporary theme an issue for us to be addressing. That's going to lead to two assignments for us this week, the smaller of which is our final readings quiz. Now, this is going to cover both week seven and week eight. So all of the work that we were doing last week in week seven, the readings we had there, plus what we're doing here in week eight. But, and that's due by the end of the course as well. And, and as it said, you know the, you know the drill on that. But our major assignment is our final paper. I want to talk with us for a few moments about that. Having done our readings, what we are going to do this week is choose from one of the following situations and write a 900 to 1200 word argumentative essay. Now, this is longer, 600 to 800 before, and it's more detailed. It's broken down into sections or parts. One portion of the paper, 300 to 400 words, must provide a biblical discussion with some reference to the Decalogue and perfect and imperfect duties. Now, I want to stop here. Sometimes we make reference to what Scripture says, but we don't cite the passage. 
We're going to be citing the commandments this time. And I expect to see you doing so, stating them right in, uh, referencing directly the commandments from Exodus chapter 20. Sometimes what happens in our papers is because we assume that inaccurately so, and this was the case, for example, in our last uh, discussion groups, that since we've talked about the Decalogue and we've talked about perfect and imperfect duties along the way, and we've talked about justice, that we can just make a casual reference. No, in this paper, I do not want you to assume that myself or anybody else that would read this paper know what these terms mean. You define them, you explain them, you apply them, and you reference them. In other words, I'm looking for you to reference what we talked about before in perfect and imperfect duties and justice. Uh, so a part of your paper must provide a biblical discussion with some reference to the Decalogue and perfect and imperfect duties. Now this is out of the 900 to 1200 words, 300 to 400, and I'm going to be looking at these sections and the proportionate size that you've written. With another 200 to 300 words, that's a non-biblical argument. It's one that you would use to convince someone who's not a Christian. Um, in an argumentative essay, we're working to, pers per to persuade uh, the reader or the person with whom we are in dialogue. We're working to convince of the position that we're taking. And so, as you would know, uh, simply because we might have a Christian worldview perspective, that does not mean that that one who has not held that Christian worldview or has reasons to reject it is going to automatically accept because we quote the Bible. No, we write this part, 200 to 300 words, as if we were working to convince a non-Christian. Here, you don't have to be worried about quoting from the Decalogue. You may reference, for example, the responsibility and desire we should have to love our neighbors as ourselves. We may think about uh, Jesus teaching to treat others the way, the way we want to be treated, right? Do unto others as we would have them do to us. But you're not writing a biblical component in this part, but you are working to convince them. And then there's a third part, and that is that you're going to contrast and compare your view, the position you've taken, either with the Christian biblical component or and with the um, uh, part to the non-Christian, with how utilitarian reasoning might address this situation. Now, I want to speak a word here about utilitarianism. Some of us, particularly in our um, week seven dialogues, uh, revealed that we have more of a tendency toward a utilitarian approach, what's the best for most that will limit suffering for most approach. Um, if, in if indeed that's how you end up approaching this, compare and contrast that with moral law. Don't just say, well, I, I'm a utilitarianism uh, or a utilitarian, and, and so I'm going to do what the situation dictates. No, you compare that and contrast that with the approach of absolute moral law that does not change. I want you to be clear on that. So three parts, 900 to 1200 words long, that doesn't count your title page, your front matter, your references page, that's the body of the paper. The first part, 300 to 400 words, biblical discussion, referencing Decalogue, perfect imperfect duties. The second part, 200 to 300 words, non-biblical argument to convince someone who's not a Christian. And then the third part, and I'm going to be watching the word counts on these sections, 200 to 300 words on how utilitarian reasoning might address this situation. All three parts are required for a successful paper. Here are the two topics from which you can choose, one or the other. Don't write on both, not both, one or the other. Topic option number one. A terminally ill patient wishes to take his own life, 70 years old, considers himself a financial burden on his family. He wants to explore the possibility of physician-assisted suicide. What would the Bible say? What would the Decalogue say? 
how do perfect and imperfect duties apply? Do that. Then how would this be argued to someone who doesn't approach moral law in that same way from the Bible, right? That's option number one. With the third approach, how would utilitarianism approach this? Uh, compare and contrast it. Here's option number two. A woman's learned that she's pregnant with a Down syndrome baby and is considering an abortion. She already has three children and the thought of having a handicapped child would be more than she would be able to handle from a financial as well as an energy and child care giving perspective. Once again, all three parts. How would this be approached? From a moral law, decalogue, perfect imperfect duties. How would you write to convince a non-Christian about this? And how would utilitarianism play into this? Those are your two your two options for writing the final paper. Here are the details of that. Once again, 900 to 1200, clear focused thesis. We've had two papers already and I've worked to provide specific ample feedback to you if you haven't done well in the past on or you need to enhance this thesis statement. This is the paper to do it. This paper is worth 25% of your total grade. It's our final paper. So you need to bring everything you've got, your best work, all of those suggestions for enhancement I provided, all of those directions I provided in past papers, you need to bring that to bear on this paper. Clear focus thesis, well-organized, uh, smooth transitions, you're aware of the opposing view, demonstrates you have an excellent understanding of the terms Decalogue, perfect and imperfect duties, moral law, while using these terms and concepts in the same way as the authors in the assigned course readings do. You make impressive insights comparing and contrasting your position with utilitarianism. You present a strong defense of biblical morality. That means we're going to be hearing from scripture about this while at the same time being persuasive to a non-Christian reader. And hear me on this. You cite properly from the course texts, scripture, or outside sources. I've worked all along to try to give you the properly formatted references so that you can put them in your paper. If you, if you go back and pick those up from where I provided them along the way, it's going to be an easy task for you to just drop those into place in your works cited page or in your footnotes, depending upon what uh, formatting style that you're going to use. I'm going to be watching this much more closely. So do not just simply willy nilly construct your own and be sure that you put in your paper the direct reference that you're making. In other words, don't simply list Philip Riken as one of your uh, sources or uh, references cited, but you never speak about Philip Riken in your paper. No, speak from Philip Riken in your paper. Speak from Thomas Aquinas. Speak from these other sources that we've been reading. So uh, uh, I'm going to be watching very closely because after all, this is our capstone assignment. This is our final paper. We need to bring all of these strands together along the way. Everything that was needed and was provided to you in feedback from the other papers, we need to see that this time in this paper. And that includes the, the polished uh, writing style with clarity, uh, no grammatical or spelling or punctuation errors. Once again, that paper needs to be submitted no later than Saturday, March 5, Saturday, March 5, if in fact you are with legitimate circumstances coming up against that deadline, uh, I expect and I want you to uh, communicate with me in advance because we're closing the course. And as you read the syllabus, we're not uh, permitted, uh, we as instructors, to accept assignments after the close of the course unless legitimate, legitimate and extenuating circumstances exist. And then we have to talk about the details of all of that. Finally, I want to take a moment here to address what all of us no doubt are aware of now, and that's the declared war of Russia on the nation of Ukraine. Depending upon where we are in the world and 
what racial or ethnic background from which we come, what nationality we possess, I think we're all unified in the horror that we feel, the worry, the hurt, uh, the perhaps outrage inwardly that we're starting to, to experience because of atrocities committed, especially against innocent people who are just living their lives. It's a good reminder for us of the fallen nature that we have in this world and that there are always going to be evil people for their reasons doing evil things against others. But we want to respond with love. We want to respond with compassion and mercy. We want to defend those who need defended. We want to stand for justice. And our Almighty God, who is the sovereign of nations and leaders, we know is not only watching, but he is controlling. And so I pray that you are praying for the people of Ukraine, their leaders, that you are praying for the people of Russia and their leaders, that you're praying for the neighboring countries around Ukraine, that peace can prevail, that sane, rational minds, people of compassion who do indeed care for their neighbors, whether they believe they're created in the image of God or not, will do the right thing here. We ask that for our own nation's leaders and our own nation's citizens as well, don't we? Let's pray to God. Let's pray to God for his kingdom to come, his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. I look forward to seeing you through the coming week. I'm nearby if needed. God bless you. Let's have a great final week together.